The margins of many medieval manuscripts contain vivid illustrations. This marginalia allows readers to learn through both texts and images, inspiring the rumination of the text in a slow process of meditation and mental ingestion. The Luchal Psalter is famous for its marginal imagery. It is believed to be the work of a single scribe and various artists who intertwine scenes of everyday life, religious images, and detailed grotesques. The Psalter was commissioned by Sir Geoffrey Luchal, who had it created to provide a permanent memorial of the status enjoyed by his family over his lifetime. The Psalter had a liturgical function, and the sequence of New Testament scenes were probably used for religious instruction in a false small family group. It was also utilized as a teaching tool for instruction and reading. It was designed to be read from a distance as it was created as a status symbol intended to be seen by others. The marginal decorations in the Psalter include fantastical images, biblical scenes, images of saints, and vignettes of daily life. These vignettes of everyday routines accurately record activities that would have been commonplace on the Luttrell estates, including tilling the earth, sowing seeds, butchering animals, and preparing banquets. There is a distinctive farming and fasting sequence, which shows Luttrell's preoccupation with the protection of his family and estates. This detail of a farmer plowing his fields is included in a sequence of farming images located in the margins of the Psalms. Comical and crude hybrids are also visible in the margins, contrasting the spiritual text and creating tension between the desires of the body and the needs of the spirit. This detail is the Luchal family at table. Sir Geoffrey sits in the center, accompanied by his wife, two sons, daughter-in-law, and two visiting Dominican friars. Many marginal illustrations in the Psalter include images of common household items, such as the serving utensils in this detail. Other artifacts include a cradle, various farm implements, and the hanging sleeves on women's garments that were fashionable at that time, an image which scholars used to date the manuscript. This image portrays longbow men practicing. The manuscript has outlived Geoffrey's branch of the Luttrell family for more than five centuries. Many ordinary aspects of daily life or medieval pastimes that are contained in the Psalter would have been familiar to a medieval audience but are now completely foreign. This detail depicts an unidentified game of skill, whose meaning has been lost in the passage of time. Interspersed among these religious scenes are grotesque creatures, serving various purposes. Some appear to be playful, an expression of artistic imagination. Others, such as this monster with a curved hooked beak and the striped body of a tiger, are symbolic. This creature appears beside an image of a boy stealing cherries from a tree while the frustrated farmer watches from below. The monster may serve a symbolic purpose, showing perhaps the dangers of thievery or else an embodiment of Satan's influence. This is a common theme, as marginal monsters often represent spiritual or physical dangers. Scholar does not contain acute, does contain acute observations of daily life recorded by the artist and glimpses into the life and philosophies of Geoffrey Luttrell in the 14th century world. The beasts of the medieval period were full of symbolism and meaning because people wanted to find divine presence everywhere. In the medieval mind, since God had created the animals, they were each symbolic in their own way, and this symbolism could be played with by combining animals together and getting monstrous, multi-symbolic results. These combinations are commonly referred to as hybrids or grotesques. In marginalia, the meanings associated with these medieval beasties are used to either complement, mock, or add entertainment to the accompanying text. An important myth that adds to hybrid symbolism overall is the Tower of Babel. The collapse of the Tower of Babel symbolizes the shattering of unity, and lore often ties this moment to the creation of the grotesques. By, ex by extension of this association, monsters are often seen as being symbols of chaos. In Deformed Discourse, David Williams said, Like language, the monster is a sign of a unity now lost, and like language, the monster is the possibility of the reconstruction of the very thing that it itself has deconstructed. In exemplum of the symbolism of two animals combined, there is a hybrid made of a reptile and a bat. Reptiles who were given a negative connotation by the snake in the biblical story of Adam and Eve were, and still often are, seen as a sign of sin. Meanwhile, bats are creatures of the night. By throwing body of reptile and wing of bat onto the parchment together, two symbolic animals are mixed to create a symbolically terrifying monster, a dragon. In marginalia, dragons are often used to personify sin or the devil, as is exemplified by this image from the Luttrell Psalter. This image depicts a man being consumed by a dragon. A medieval audience would have seen this as him being consumed by sin or the devil, and the fact that the artist painted him well endowed suggests sins of lust. 
Sometimes the symbolism is not in the grotesques or animals themselves, but what they are wearing or the context they are put in. As symbols of disorder in society, sometimes grotesque clothes would likewise be chaotic or insulting to the church. This female monkey is showing the lining of her clothing, which is symbolic of wrongdoing. In the medieval period, prostitutes were punished for their sins by having to wear their clothes inside out. Similarly, this image, the, in this image, the blue person is representing the Scottish who were fighting, who were fighting the British at the time the Lutrell Psalter was made. Insult is added to injury because they are depicted wearing a flying veil, the likes of which were condemned by the church as devil sails. Likewise, this hybrid's buttons would have been seen as frivolous by some churchmen. Despite all of this fabulous symbolism, it is important to remember that sometimes these fabulous grotesques were just for fun or to make an old translated text more appealing to its new audience. This fabulous creature, for example, is completely bizarre and most likely just there to make the page more lively and colorful. However, hybrids were not always accepted in medieval culture without question. In the 12th century, Bernard of Clairvaux asked, What excuse can there be for these ridiculous monstrosities in the cloisters where the monks do their reading? Extraordinary things at once beautiful and ugly. His qualms were countered by St. Augustine, who asked if grotesques were descendants of Adam with souls, which would make them glorious symbols of God's omnipotence and give them every right to be in religious texts. No matter if they are symbolic or whimsical, these wonderful beasts reflect the medieval mind and imagination. They both literally and figuratively encompass the medieval world, which is magical in and of itself. Despite his cynical views, Bernard has one thing right. These beasts are extraordinary things. Marginalia for laughs. Any occasional peruser of medieval texts is no stranger to the weird and wildly twisted grotesque images that clutter the margins of Psalters, Bibles, and other texts. In the Latral Psalter, these lewd beasties hug sacred words and holy prayer and their horrific tentacles and other appendages, a shocking juxtaposition. So the question on everyone's mind is why? An important function of these figures is humor. This humor takes two forms. The first is lighthearted com commentary, rooted in folkloric and oral traditions. The second is heavy satire to demonize and dehumanize non-Christians. Cheeky grotesques adorn the lower and upper margins of the literal Psalter. Michael Camille's description of a marginal babe win on folio 18 of the literal Psalter best expresses the absurdist humor behind such images. A pug-nosed, piggish human face with speckled yellow legs stares in dismay as his own cabbage tail spouts up from between his legs with a tentacular ejaculatory gush. These images were previously constructed by scholars as low, tasteless perversions of an individual's sick mind. Though, as Camille points out, the images could not have appeared tasteless to Jeff Jeffrey Luttrell. The Psalter symbolized his power and wealth, and he had it lavishly illuminated. We can deduce from this that the grotesques were commonplace folkloric images with oral roots, and they were placed on the margins of literary tradition for humorous commentary. The startlingly crude creatures of the Littrell Psalter provide infinite chuckles for any passing reader. However, interwoven with the jaunty pigmen and goofy flipper-footed vase heads are disturbing racial slurs surrounding enemies of Christ. Satirical depictions of Jews, Ethiopians, Mongols, and Muslims are used to dehumanize these non-Christian others. While these images hardly appear humorous to the modern gaze, it is conceivable how they might appear satirically amusing to the medieval Christian audience. The image creators used satire as a tool to moralize. The stereotypical, largely constructed traits of Jews, Muslims, and Ethiopians are wildly exaggerated in marginalia. Jews possess hooked or crooked noses, which signify traits like voraciousness, lechery, and arrogance, traits associated with the devil while Ethiopians and Muslims are swathed in black and blue skin, a color, the color black being symbolic of evil. A contemporary example of exaggerated depictions is political cartoons. Political and public figures are satirized and debased with a similar means of moralizing propaganda. For instance, compare a depiction of Richard the Lionheart facing off with Saladin found in folio 82 of the Littrell Psalter. Hook-nosed, dark-skinned Saladin, leader of the Muslim defensive during the Crusades, is rendered with distorted figures and fitch, ew, distorted features and rides a horse whose prominent buck teeth, Deborah Higgs Strickland says in her book, Saracens, Demons, and Jews, gives the beast a look of incompetence, if not downright goofiness. A recent depiction of Olivia Chow, a Canadian politician, strikes up similar similarities by projecting morality steeped in racism. Chow is depicted with exaggerated Asian features, slanted eyes, and yellow sk yellowed skin. The humor of these satirical images, both contemporary and medieval, is not light. It's pejorative 
and discriminatory implications require unpacking. During the medieval ages, myth, folklore, and Christianity were rampant among the citizens, oftentimes equally valid or spoken about undividedly. Stories circulated to instruct moral conduct, and with these came the images of which marginal beasts were drawn from and associated. At the time, there was a great excitement regarding the world and travel, but with the exhilaration came a natural fear of the unknown. Creatures with animalistic and monstrous elements, described in texts as wild barbarian beasts, began appearing in the fringes of manuscripts, maps, and so forth, leading the way in visual demonstrations of a culture of varying ethics. Marginal creatures were fluid in form, giving no definite body to the threats of the unknown. This, in combination with humanoid features, reinforces the notion that demons are not only partially within the individuals deemed holy, but also always within the fringe of their physical existence. This constant watchfulness and presence maintains a hold on the people who spread both folklore and Christian teachings, which usually went hand in hand. Loyalties to the church, family, and keeping of faith were stressed principles. These peripheral drawings often appear along unknown territories of various maps in locations where the culture was not Christian and therefore blasphemous. The creatures were made semi-barbarous to affirm the presence of cannibal savages in a long tradition of reducing the other's grotesque physique to an overall grotesque culture. An example can be made of Christopher Columbus's surprise upon arrival to the Caribbean that the locals were beautiful and matched the European standards of proportion. Because of said realization, however, they could no longer be considered the literal monsters they were purported to be. To rectify this humanization, rumors of cannibalism spread and filled the gap. Anglo-Saxon literature in particular had a tendency to incorporate half-glimpsed creatures and have the forests or lands outside of monasteries inhabited by monsters. As the biblical verse 35-7 states, in the nest in which first lived dragons, reeds, and rushes may arise. This demonstrates the concept of a human hero battling satanic forces evil and moral liminality via nature, which is grounded and therefore not heavenly. South African races tended to merge into unified conglomerations of monstrosity, implying that normality rested in Europe solely. By lumping monsters together on these maps, the cre creators established a diametric world where there is a constant battle between Christian men and all else they deemed monsters. The marginal regions together form the antithesis of the holy center. This explains maps that focused around Jerusalem. Absurdly constructed circular maps focused upon geographic um, locations and monstrosity suggest European discomfort with its spirituality in emphasizing its religious division between Christian and pagan beliefs by othering. Marginal art is about the anxiety of nomination and in the problem of signifying nothing in order to give birth to meaning at the center. The distorted human form of the two-faced man from Marvels of the East establishes the embodiment of internal struggles and decision-making, as well as miscegenation. The face on the left has a longer, more pronounced nose, alluding to the man of Jewish ancestry. To add, the horn he carries implies a certain overindulgence. It is likened to an arox horn, which could contain two liters of liquid, and were traditionally passed around tables at feast. The two-faced man holds it alone, consuming its full contents, and the symbolic vessel bound men to one another, therefore reducing the two-faced man's humanity. 
These creatures and illustrations that occupy the margins of the Littrell Psalter serve many functions. The rural scenes are a useful tool for determining daily medieval life. Aside from being very humorous, the grotesques embody rich symbolic traditions and convey strong moral messages for the medieval reader. We would like to conclude our presentation with a grotesque of our own. We have taken a page, folded it over four times, and each drawn a segment of our beast's body that corresponds to the topic we worked on. Respectively, these topics are morality, rural life, grotesques, and humor.